Hi everyone, this is Alan McKay. Welcome to episode 72. I'm talking with Mike Blum. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Alan McKay Podcast. Alan is an Emmy Award-winning visual effects artist and mentor to many leading industry experts. Listen in as Alan talks with other industry leaders in film, video games, and visual effects about their experience, lessons, and methodology. Alan will teach you pivotal advice to fast-track your career, better your skills, and reach your ultimate dream job. Check out the latest episodes on alanmckay.com. Hey, this is Alan. So just a quick thing to check out, www.vfxrates.com. This is a website that I created to solve a massive problem that we all have. What should we be charging? This is one of the giant mysteries that we all have and most people feel very uncomfortable talking about is what we should charge as a freelance rate. And the worst part is when we go to apply for a job, if we ask too much, we risk alienating the employer and never getting that call back. Whereas if we play it safe and ask too little, we not only get taken advantage of, but on top of that, we leave a lot of money on the table, which potentially over the span of a year can lead up to tens of thousands of dollars. So this is a chance for you to quickly go to the website, vfxrates.com, put in a few basic bits of information based on your city, your experience, your discipline, software, little factors that are very important to figuring out what you should be charging as your base rate when you're going to an employer. Now, this is based on a lot of research, but more importantly, it's based on a brain trust of industry experts from different fields that we've all pulled together and being able to maintain this as a very accurate way to generate what you should be charging. The best part is, is not only what you should be charging, but also potentially what you could be charging by tweaking a few things to how you present yourself, building your brand, learning to negotiate better. Also, other factors like building an irresistible reel learning to approach employers the correct way, learning to network, a lot of other factors. I want to share all this information for free. Go to www.vfxrates.com and find out what you should be charging for your hourly VFX rate. All right, so welcome to episode 72. Uh, I'm really excited. I always say that I'm really excited, but I am excited because this is actually the first episode for the new year. I realize that as I'm about to put this out, I think it's scheduled for around mid-February. So it's a little bit late in the game. And the reason for that, it's kind of funny, but whenever we open up registration for the live action series, it's always about a month of recuperating afterwards. And that's what happened over Christmas. Um, A lot hasn't been going on, but uh, I went to Canada for Christmas. And right before that, I decided to do something really cool, which I was excited to do, which is I went with a small team down to downtown Los Angeles and we shot around the LA River and we put together this really cool bunch of footage. Uh, we shot it all on the Red Epic Dragon. And um, it was basically from there, what we did is I posted the footage online and I had everyone vote for what they would love to do as a visual effects shot. So I wanted everyone to submit ideas and see what they could come up with. And I thought this would be really fun because I wanted to do something for the end of the year and get everyone to learn a new skill, to do something really neat uh, and really fun to, you know, to be able to pull off. Now, rather than me coming up with the idea, I thought it'd be cool for everyone to submit their own favorite ideas based on the footage I supplied. So this was a professional film crew uh, and you know, what I wanted to do wasn't too professional. It was basically, I wanted to do kind of like found a footage. So it wasn't going to be uh, something where we had a crane and did anything ridiculous, but it was more to do with um, just having something that looks beautiful and being able to uh, use all the professional gear to pull that off. So shooting all the HDRI, doing all the camera tracking, um, building all the models, um, building them all so that way we could do them for use them for dynamics later on. A lot of cool stuff that we did. And the cool thing was I had, um, I forget now, I think it was close to a thousand submissions, which was pretty cool. And uh, I ended up going through them by myself. Originally, I was going to have a team of people sorting through it, but I figured that doesn't really make sense because, you know, we're not all going to be able to um, communicate and say what's cool while we're going through it all. So I ended up doing it all by myself, which took about a day, but a big day to, uh, to do. But the whole goal of this was that, um, you know, we shoot all the footage, we get everyone to supply ideas based on what they uh, see in the footage. And then the top 10 ideas 
I would get everyone to vote on. And that's something that we had thousands upon, well, I was going to say thousands upon thousands. I think it was thousands of people. I think it was just under 10,000 people um, submit votes for that. And it might have actually been more. Sorry, I'm rambling, but I think it was actually more. It's been quite a while now, but it was just so cool. It was really awesome to have everyone submit their ideas and then be able to vote on what the coolest idea was. The funniest thing of all was, uh, and I didn't actually tell anyone this, I, I, I meant to, but I didn't get around to it. Um, the top two actually were a draw. I don't know what kind of like numbers you would have to uh, figure out here. It was something like 1,248 uh, votes or whatever, but there was two of them. So one was like a plane crash, the other one was a re reverse gravity effect. And it was just so weird that these two drew. They had the exact same amount of votes. And then the other one, I forget what it was, but there was a third one that came in pretty close. And then the rest, it was a landslide, basically. It was just, um, those were the top three, but two of them drawing. It was just like, what are the odds? And um, it was cool. So I went out and I did this whole training series for free and I put it online and I got everyone to interact and, and do all the stuff. And it was just kind of cool, like while I was in Canada, I was finishing up some of the videos. And that's the one thing that I kind of regret a little bit, um, just because I was killing myself trying to get this all done before I left. And I got most of it done, but I then figured, okay, I'll have to record the last two videos from Canada on my laptop, remoting, you know, remotely accessing my office in LA. And um, I don't know, I just, I feel like I kind of dropped the ball a little bit there because I really wanted this to be the best it could be. And, you know, I'm proud of what I did, but um, I did promise my family that I would spend Christmas with them and I wouldn't be working, which, you know, for me and some people, it can be a bit of a habit. Um, but yeah, this was really cool. And the reason I'm mentioning all this was just the fact that um, around that time, we opened registration for the live action series and that was cool. Uh, it was so awesome. In fact, um, again, I had to turn people away because we filled up way too quick. And, um, but it was just awesome. It was, it's been so cool getting to interact, doing live sessions and doing a lot of stuff with everyone in there. And, um, but yeah, like between those videos, between uh, getting the course all set up for the beginning of the year, being in Canada, and a couple other things I'll mention in a moment, uh, I needed to take a bit of a, a break while I just kind of like focused on the course. And uh, so finally, now the podcast is back in full swing. And it's really awesome because I've still been uh, interviewing people and building episodes, but I just haven't been publishing them yet, which means for me, I kind of feel like this is the last time there'll ever be a bit of a hiatus because uh, I hate doing it when, when there's a bit of a, a break in between. It's kind of like if you're doing Walking Dead and there was never ever that like six month break in the, in the middle or something. But um, this was great just to be able to get a lot of episodes out. And now I think that we've got so many that is just going to be never ending. Uh, in fact, there's so many great episodes coming up, including this one um, with a lot of pretty amazing directors, animators, artists, um, effects guys, authors. There's lots of great stuff coming. I'm, I'm psyched. I'm really excited. So... The other big news was that I bought a house and I got engaged. I keep forgetting that one. Uh, people keep congratulating me in, uh, in, in the live reviews that we have. And I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> forgot about that part as well. So I'm going to be putting out a lot of information about a lot of stuff that's coming up. Um, one of the big ones is that I'm going to be speaking in Paris in March. So end of March, about 30 days from when this episode goes live. And that's going to be great. It's the It's Art Masterclass. I've been speaking at a few of those, well, all of them uh, since it started. And this year I'm going to be helping um, host things a little bit as well, which will be kind of cool. Uh, and the speakers are amazing. Um, a lot of the speakers I'm actually going to be interviewing on this podcast leading up to it. So I kind of figure it'll be a good way to kind of just push a little bit of uh, promotion towards the, the event, you know, just to get attention to it. But more importantly, just a chance to give a lot of insight to a lot of these amazing speakers. So some of the people going uh, already have been guests on the podcast. So uh, Ash Thorpe, obviously uh, Dan Rorty, another, another amazing artist. And there's also going to be like Neil Blevins, Andrew Schmidt, who's the one of the directors at DreamWorks, Mike Blum, who is on this episode, um, Nathan Faux, uh, Joaquin Baldwin. There are so many cool, so many talented people. Mark Simonetti, who's also been on the podcast, loads of people. So I think that this, um, this year is going to be so freaking cool. Best part is everyone's bringing their partners as well. Uh, I think I mentioned Neil Blevins, but if I didn't, obviously Neil Blevins is a massive, massive name, uh, talented guy at Pixar. 
and everyone's bringing their partners so i think it's going to be really cool for all of us just to hang out since pretty much all of us are good friends and know each other otherwise i'm sure we'll become great friends when we're there so um this to me i'm really excited about getting to talk to a lot of the speakers and at the same time um, give a big plug to the event because i love going every time i go i meet so many amazing people um, a lot of the people in my mentorship as well as the live action series uh, all show up so I think it's really cool selfishly because um, a lot of people in Europe usually all fly out and we all hang out. There's other people actually on the podcast like Alf Levold who's going to come out and hang out as well and um, Sol Rogers as well. So, you know, it's just going to be this amazing week of hanging out with cool people who have ridiculous amounts of talent, uh, all getting to, you know, meet and greet everyone who's attending. And there's so many great um, students as well as um, attendees that it's just always the funnest time where we're all uh, socially hanging out. And I feel like this event is better than any event I've been to in terms of the interaction between the speakers and the students. Most places you might do a bit of a QA and a and talk to people, um, but there's not that much interaction. Whereas here, it's literally a week hanging out nonstop, uh, doing portfolio reviews, um, doing shots, <laughs> doing crazy, uh, crazy amounts of stuff. And it's just like every single night hanging out with everyone. And yeah, I think it's great. I, for me, if I were attending, and I'm not trying to plug this, it's just more me being excited about the event, but uh, I would love this sort of thing because it's so, so cool. And I've made so many friendships with a lot of the attendees who are going just because like we're all hanging out at bars and having a good time. So I'm excited about that, and um, I've got some really cool episodes coming up, uh, including uh, more immigration ones, because I thought it was a really great episode with um, Amanda Gillespie talking about immigrating to the U.S. and getting work permits and all that kind of stuff, and because of that, I wanted to do a few more episodes on that subject, discussing how to get work permits inside of Canada, Europe, Australia, UK, and I might just can kind of continue on from there, but um, already there's been some really great episodes I've been putting together on those subjects. Uh, on top of that, I'm going to be touching on hardware. So I'm going to be bringing on a few experts to discuss um, a lot of industry hardware, as well as um, really hands-on episodes about working from home, building your own company. Um, there's, there's lots coming up, as well as health, and that's going to be a really cool one. I'm going to be talking with a good friend of mine who is a personal trainer for a lot of really high-end entrepreneurs. And when I say high-end, I'm talking guys who make seven or eight figures a year. So guys who completely crush it in their field, but at the same time, uh, obviously don't have much time for themselves. And I felt like that is a great connection to VFX where a lot of us are working ridiculous hours. We're working ourselves into the ground um, and we barely make time for our health. And I'm definitely someone who's um, had those habits from time to time. So um, this is something that I want to kind of talk in a, a bit of a, a series about as well, um, both about my experiences a couple of years ago with um, health issues, like, you know, injured my back really badly uh, you know, out of nowhere just because I'm working too much and just other things like that, but also bringing on a few people who, uh, you know, really focus on those areas and talking a lot of insight into those as well. So I won't go on and on forever, but there's so much cool stuff coming up that I'm really excited about. Uh, I also have a great episode next episode, episode 73 with Pixelogic, uh, obviously who makes ZBrush and we're going to dive into some really awesome stuff there as well. So that's going to be another one that's going to be really, really awesome. Okay. So this episode is with Mike Blum, who is a director. He's done some really amazing short films as well as worked with Disney for over a decade. Um, he's got such great insight and also is doing so many cool things on the side on top of that. And I feel like a lot of his experience over his career, it's just been really great to, um, to really kind of dive into a lot of the thought process that he has, uh, a lot of insights he's gained over his experience of his career. So in general, I think that like, I was excited to talk to him about a lot of what he's accomplished, but at the same time, a lot of what we talk about, uh, I didn't really plan and it, we just kind of dove right in and it's really great stuff that I learned a lot. I had a lot of fun and we nerded out about a lot of stuff, but in general, I just found it to be really inspiring and I'm sure you will as well. 
anyway, like I said, a bit of rambling right now just because there's so much uh, great stuff coming up and I'm just excited to touch base on a lot of things that have happened over the past uh, two months, I think, since the last episode, which was in December. All right, so let's dive into this episode with Mike Blum. I'll just say, uh, again, thanks again for doing this. And uh, I just figured let's just start out with, like, do you want to give a quick introduction to who you are and what you're currently up to? All right. Well, again, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, my name is uh, Mike Blum. Um, I am the owner of Pipsqueak Films. We're a boutique um, uh, animation production company in Los Angeles. Um, and before that, I, uh, I was at uh, Disney Feature Animation for 11 and a half years in a sort of variety of supervisory uh, positions. Um, and uh, I am also the co-founder of a new organization called Our Next Four Years, um, which I'm sure we'll talk about as we as we go forward. Cool. That's awesome, man. And I was just kind of curious. I mean, usually I love, you know, hearing a lot of artist origin stories and kind of understanding, you know, how they got started because everyone's got such a, a different way that they kind of broke into the industry and really or found their passion. So for you, like, how did you initially get started? Okay. Yeah. So I, I, I will, I will, I will add to your repertoire of unique <laughs> stories because I don't think I've ever met anyone quite like myself in terms of background. Um, so I, I actually have um, a technical background, super technical background, like, uh, you know, undergraduate degree in computer engineering and uh, graduate degree in computer science where I was doing computer animation. Um, and my entree into this world. I mean, I never thought like I would be making films, directing or writing, like never even crossed my mind. Uh, but I fell in love with animation my senior year in uh, college. I went to grad school for it. And then um, after a short stint after graduate school, I ended up at Disney Feature Animation in their technology group. Um, and, you know, I was writing software, you know, started out just like I was a programmer. I was writing software tools um, to help the company and the animators, uh, make our animated films. Um, but probably I don't know, I'm, I'm going to guess it's like six months or a year into that. Um, I kind of realized like the technology group, the production group, uh, they didn't really talk very well together. Um, no one in technology really understood how production worked, including myself. I mean, you know, I was, I was just a kid. Um, and I said, oh, we, we got to do something about this. So I, I sort of convinced um, the technology department to green light a training project where we would go just the technology group. We would uh, make a short film using the same processes, same pipeline as we would use for our feature films. And I reckon that if we could do that, then we'd have a much better understanding of what production went through. We'd be able to write better tools. Um, I, I thought it seemed like a, a cool idea. Um, and probably two weeks into that project, I realized, oh my God, I fucking love this. <laughs> um, and, um, I spent basically the next 10 years, uh, training myself, um, to be a creative, you know, I, um, kind of directed that first short, um, and, uh, you know, showed it to the president of feature animation. And he's like, ah, oh, it's really good. Go do another one. And, uh, he had great advice. Uh, he was like, you know, use the same characters, use the same setting, but tell a different story. Like, you know, keep improving. Uh, and that second one, um, you know, the first one was good enough that uh, the second one we were able to pitch as a training project for the entire company. And so I was able to sort of leverage all of these incredibly talented people who were kind of stuck doing things that they didn't quite, you know, wasn't quite what they wanted to do or they wanted to learn something else. Uh, but they were super talented. And um, you know, my my principle was like, if you're willing to work and learn, come on and 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 help out. Uh, and that project was probably, you know, it's probably 10 times better uh, just kind of quality wise than the first one. Uh, and that that one, you know, one started winning a bunch of awards and, and so forth. And so that one begat a, a third short. Um, again, this is all over like a 10 year period, mm -hmm. um, 10 year period of like kind of working literally every night after work, like six to 10, six to 11, just sort of put my 10,000 hours in, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Mark, uh, whatever the uh, Gladwell's book wasn't out at that point, but, uh, <laughs> you could have written it for I, him, but, but yeah, but I was like, that's, that's kind of what it was. Um, and that third one, uh, now the second one was good enough. That third one was basically just like, yeah, Mike, you know, you can go do what you want with whoever you wanted, uh, whoever you want in the company. And at that point, um, you know, I had the art director of Chicken Little and, you know, I had like, you know, some of the best animators at Disney kind of all pitching in to help with this third project. And that one kind of blew up. And that was the 
the short film called The Zit played in like, you know, like 150 festivals, won a ton of awards. Um, and it was the first thing that got me, you know, so I got my, my first agent. Um, and in a, uh, a fairly direct way is the thing that uh, got me my first um, professional directing gig. Um, and, uh, you know, ultimately I realized that like, you know, I was never going to get a chance at Disney. Um, I had moved over during the course of this 10 years, I had moved over to production. I was one of the supervisors. Um, there's like four supervisors on the big feature film. So I was like one of the four supervisors, um, and, uh, working on our first project for about 18 months. Um, and, it was this uh, offshoot of Disney feature animation that was called the Circle Seven Studio. Yeah. Uh, sensibly, you know, the, the goal was to do these theatrical Pixar sequels. Um, and so we were hard at work. We had hundreds of people that we had hired. Um, you know, we had a you know, third draft of a script. Uh, you know, we were rolling along and Disney bought Pixar. And on day number one, um, they fired the president of feature animation. Day number two, they shut down our studio. And literally a week, maybe two weeks later, I got an offer to direct a series for um, uh, Comedy Central. And I said, you know, it's time to go. That's so cool. Um, so, yeah. So I left and I never went back. Yeah. Like uh, I had Carlos and Guiano, buddy of mine. Um, he he was at Circle 7 during that time. And I had him hit him on the podcast because, you know, I think everyone got like a six month severance. So um, he just went out and like learned to shoot guns for six months and uh ended up becoming really passionate about that a lot more than he was about 3d um you know so it's, it's kind of funny how in a way um there's so many people i know who it was kind of a blessing in disguise like getting to leave that project and have a bit of security they were able to actually find the thing that they're really passionate about or opportunities came up that um they were suddenly available for which was pretty cool yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, it's hard to get any opportunity at all in this business. It's hard. Um, so uh, for me, it was, you know, it was easy um, <coughs> just sort of having an opportunity to, you know, direct something professionally for the first time and get paid for it. Uh, yet you have to leap at those opportunities. And, you know, I was fortunate. You see, you get a lot of people um, in this industry that come at it the other way. They like they spend 10 years you know, not making money and not having any, um, you know, a ton of experience, but they're trying to sort of do their passion projects. And, you know, um, that's great. Uh, it wasn't my, wasn't my path. It's hard when you have no money and you're trying to sort of make it, but I, you know, I, I was able to earn a good living for, you know, uh, you know, whatever, like a dozen years. And so when I did leave, uh, yeah, in addition to, um, uh, whatever severance Disney gave me, uh, you know, I just sort of had the security of knowing that, you know, I'd work for a while. I, I didn't spend it all. And um, and, uh, and and that definitely made it a lot easier to kind of move on to the next thing. I think it's really important is momentum. You know, it's like if if you go from not working to working, that's one thing. But if you're staying busy, I kind of feel like you, you know, kind of welcome a lot more things. You have a lot more opportunities you're creating because you're constantly around other people. You have that mindset of being busy and, and constantly challenging yourself and growing. Whereas if, you know, if you're just doing your passion project as your full-time thing, because I know so many people who they keep telling me like, oh, once this movie's done, I'm going to take six months off. I'm going to go do this thing that I want to do. And I keep saying like, why don't you just go do it now? Like today, you know, even if it's just chipping away at it, at least you're doing something. But to go and try and commit to something later on, like you, you kind of slow down and um, things, you know, that six months is just, you, you barely get off the ground. Whereas if you're constantly staying busy and you're creating time to do it, it means that you value the time during that time that you have. But on top of that, you never know what things could happen during that, um, you know, during that period where you're constantly meeting with people and creating opportunities because you've got this thing in the back of your mind. And let's say if you bump into someone at lunch that, may uh, be looking to fund something or whatever could, could actually come up, at least then um, you're going to be able to connect the dots. Whereas if you're, you know, uh, bundled away in your in your room, working away on your thing, then you just don't have that inspiration. You don't also have that outward connection. So, yeah, I think it's really critical to have that uh, momentum always, like doing a lot and staying busy rather than um, kind of slowing things down and trying to say, okay, I'm going to, you know, work on this and be the starving artist and, and see if I get by. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, I think you put, touched on two things, which I think are important. You know, A, you know, uh, this is not an industry where you can, you know, in general, 99.9% .9 of us, you can't do it all alone. So mm -hmm. you really do. And, and for me, that's the fun of it. Like, I don't want to do it all by myself. I like working with people. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always amazed at working with um, people who have skills that like I will never have. Um, and being able to sort of like bring all of that kind of disparate talent together to do something that, you know, one or a couple individuals by themselves couldn't do by themselves. I think like that to me is super fun. And that's something that you need to be around people to be able to accumulate enough contacts. And then the other thing, which I think, you know, you said, which is, yeah, I totally agree with, like, you got to keep chipping away. Um, and it kind of reminds me of it's just like my very favorite piece of advice that I like give to every young kid that I talk to. Um, that I was given by Barry Cook. Um, uh, he's uh, he directed Milan and uh, a bunch of other um, uh, features, and he was like an early uh, mentor, I'd say, at uh, at Disney Feature Animation. Mm -hmm. and he told me very early on, he's like, Mike, every day, every day, you got to do something for your project. Doesn't matter if you're like you're, you know, if it's like you don't have to necessarily be animating a scene every day, but you better be making a, you know, a phone call, writing an email. You cannot let one day go by. None. Zero. Seven days a week. You have to do something every day to move your rock forward. He said, if you don't do that pretty soon, you're like, ah, I'll take two days off and then it's a week and then it's a month and then you're years down the road and you're like, why didn't I? work on that project that I was really into That's it. And for whatever reason that like really stuck with me. And I, I have taken that to heart. I've always, um, I've always, always, always put time in every day to move projects forward that, that I want to do again, even when it's like a, you know, I'm on a gig that, uh, you know, that someone is paying me to do. I am always thinking about what is the next thing? How am I going to, you know, how am I going to push these, you know, 50 boulders, um, up this incredibly steep hill, bit by bit so yeah i guess uh, in a way that is momentum as well you know it's like you're you're that negative uh, flow where you know the 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 more time you kind of allow for laziness or distraction the more you're going to commit to that instead of committing to the thing that you want to um really push forward and I, I do i do think that um the only way to really get good at any craft and you kind of said it before is like ten thousand hours like you need to fully immerse yourself uh in it and by forcing yourself every day to put in that little bit, no matter what, it means that bit by bit, you're going to start putting in more of that time and you'll, you know, you start to, uh, to f everything you do starts to, uh, relate to what you're doing and you find inspiration in places you never would have thought of if you hadn't been every day immersing yourself in that, that thing that you're, you're, uh, working on. I think that's really awesome. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so what I was also going to sort of mention after that though, was, um, you know, so, uh, the, the, the rest of the story is like that story that is told is like, oh, it sounds, you know, whatever, you know, you make whatever, uh, you, you want of it. But what I found is I sort of expected, uh, once you did, once I, once I, uh, I left Disney, this sort of a, I'd say a mistake, another sort of mistake I made, if you're interested in sort of things that maybe people can, uh, I'm all can about take the away mistakes. from this. <laughs> I'm always yeah, about well, that. yeah. Like, you know, that first project that I directed uh, turned out to be like a huge hit, you know, uh, in, in terms of at least what had come before. I got nominated for an Emmy for it. Uh, you know, it got into Sundance. I, you know, it was in competition at Annecy. You know, I was like, I was like, well, this is great. This is so like, this is amazing. This is exactly what I wanted. And I, I was expecting I had an agent and I was like, OK, so I'm going to get more opportunities now. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was crickets. Like, literally, I got. I got zero meetings, like no one called me. Um, and, uh, and I, and I, at the same time I, I had an agent. So I was like, Oh, well, you know, I don't have to do that thing, which I had been doing for 10 years, which was like proactively, um, uh, going after contacts and establishing relationships with, I don't need the network uh, anymore. I got, I got my guy and he's going <laughs> to do all the work right. for me. Yeah, exactly. Cause I thought that's how it worked. Um, and, uh, and I also was like, Oh, well, you know, um, I know what I need to do next in order to really have me people see me in a different light. Um, and part, part of what I told myself, I think was, was, was accurate, but I think I was also just naive. Um, and you know, unless you're a big, big guy making lots of money for your agent, your agent's probably not going to spend a lot of time on you. Um, and that certainly was my experience. 
Um, and, you know, it took a few years. I'd say it took probably three years for me to realize, like, what am I doing? Like, I'm just sitting, I'm writing every day, but like nothing is really happening, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and it, you know, after about three years, I was like, all right, I got to go back to what was working for me, how I was able to sort of, you know, proceed along, uh, in my career for those, uh, you know, that time while I was at Disney, just sort of being this incredibly persistent, won't take no for an answer, always trying to kind of move projects along, not just to be on my computer or in my head, but, you know, in, into reality. Um, and, um, yeah, I'd say it probably took about three, about three years. Uh, and then I, I shifted and I kind of realized what I needed to do in order to, um, get back to it. And, and that's when things really started happening. Uh, you know, when I took control, um, of my career, like totally by myself, like to stopped trying to think that the agent or the manager or the lawyer was, was going to um, kind of push things along. I think that's so valuable because like, I think in general, no matter what industry you're in, no matter what you're doing, uh, a lot of us tend to fall into the category of being cattle, you know, being herded around and, and not necessarily, like, you know, for being a director or a writer, that's something where obviously you, you do need to be proactive. But in general, if you were to look at, let's say, a 3D artist or a designer or anyone working for an employer, typically a lot of people tend to think, okay, well, you know, I just go to work and I do a good job and then I'll magically get money, promotions and all these other things. And it's not until you do take your career into your own hands and start to say, okay, well, what can I do to better my chances of of, uh, success? That's when things change because you need to start evaluating what you're doing, what you could be doing more of because doing just doing the work is one thing, but if you really want to kind of step up and get what you're after, then you really need to say, okay, well, even if I am getting success, how do I 10 X that? How do I go beyond um, that and get like, you know, to the next level? Yeah, that's right. And I think that um, there's a bunch of stuff that starts to happen as you've been in this industry for, uh, for a bit of time, you know, you see other people around you that you you're like, Oh man, they're not as good as I am. Or, you know, they're just, they're, they're doing, uh, they're doing something and they're succeeding in a way that I can. And I think that, I mean, I'm sure you've seen this, like, you know, people who have been in the business for five or 10 years, they, they, there's this like jadedness Mm -hmm. that starts to creep in. And I think that like everyone needs to kind of fight against that at every level. Like this industry is, uh, it's, you know, either intentionally or unintentionally set up to have all these little barriers that kind of prevent that forward momentum. And you got it like, well, I mean, you can be bitter, I guess, but I think it makes you (laughs) unhappy. I think it, right. I mean, like, you know, those barriers, you're not going to change those. Like that, you're not going to change the industry. You're not going to change how the industry works, how it perceives you. Um, And again, it's the same, whether artist, producer, direct, like it's all the same because they're all the same barriers. So either like, you know, get this thicker and thicker jaded skin um, and, you know, uh, you know, run the risk of becoming kind of like this miserable person by by mid career or you just sort of if not embrace it, accept it mm-hmm. and just go like, yeah, it's there. There are these biases. There are these roadblocks. But I love what I do and I'm going to figure out how to do more of it, do do better, get more money for it. Um, whatever your goals are, you sort of like, you, you need to sort of like pursue them in a way that, um, uh, that doesn't like suck the energy <laughs> out of you and everyone else around you. Uh, and I think that what happens is if you don't sort of proactively do that, people notice, right? I mean, like you, how many, how many artists have you seen where you're like, oh man, like, I don't really want to work with that guy. Cause mm-hmm. he's just going to like complain, yep. uh, you know, all day. And I just like, I, I don't want to be around that energy. Um, so I, I always, I always like try to like acknowledge how the business works and then not let it stop me. And, and then, you know, fortunately I'm in a position where in a lot of projects now I, I actually get to choose the people that I'm around. Um, you know, I'm the one that's doing the hiring and I'm always looking at, at, at that. Like, I don't want that jaded person. I want that person that, um, that really loves what they, they do and, you know, just wants to, wants to do good work. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I kind of see it from like both sides. Like I, I felt the pressure on me to sort of like potentially go down that road. 
Um, and I fought against it. And, and then as sort of like, you know, the owner of a studio, like you're always talking to people and evaluating, uh, you know, who would be right for a, you know, a particular job. And you're definitely like factoring all that in when you're, um, when you're looking to, you know, to bring folks on. So Mm -hmm. anyway, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, um, yeah, in terms of negative people, like I think it's so critical and I think some people don't realize it, but you know, I've had people I worked with who will walk in the room and every single day it's one of three things. It's either going to be what's happening in North Korea or how Canada is taking all of our jobs or something else. And bit by bit, it's just, you know, you don't want to be around those people. And uh, I'm in the same boat. Like I usually am the one who gets to build teams for uh, specific projects. And that that is a constant conversation that comes up and it's not because it's like oh they're negative it's more because they can be poisoned to an environment if you want to have a really great crew of people who come in they do their job then one of the key things is you don't want dramatic people you don't want negative people who just make everyone else miserable because you got to think in the bigger picture about like okay how do i make this whole machine work perfectly and you know flawlessly without any uh, issues coming up. And if you got these certain kind of hand grenades that you drop in your office and watch the whole thing explode and, and get messy, those are the people that even if they were really great at what they do, they're usually someone you'd be hesitant to bring in because they're going to uh, derail the morale of the, the entire project. Yeah, totally. Um, and it's hard, like what we do is hard. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's it takes a ton of effort. Um, you know, it doesn't matter how, how much faster computers are or what version of software you're using that year. Like it still always takes a ton of, you know, man hours to, you know, to use these electronic pencils essentially, um, to make beautiful images. And, um, yeah, you know, you, you want to do that with a group of people who like appreciate like what happens at the end that we're all working towards the same goal and yeah, they're going to be roadblocks again, but that's, that's the job. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, whether it's technical roadblock or client roadblock or, you know, whatever, like it's not all going to go exactly the way you want. Um, but you know, you roll with the punches and you try to, you try to, you try to do the best you can, um, with what you're given. Yeah. Um, and do you want to be yeah. there at midnight, uh, sitting next to someone who's just like, everything sucks. Or do you want to be next to someone who's like, all right, let's get this done. You know, let's all band together and, and get shit out the door. Um, so I was curious, like wh- going back to, uh, when you first started doing these short films, more to kind of like test out, um, you know, your pipeline and everything else. And by the way, that actually reminds me of like Chub Chubs, which, uh, Sony did in like 2003. Cause yeah, yeah. They, they did that specifically just because they were like, all right, we're going to build a new pipeline. And to do that, the best way to do it is to, you know, do a test run and why not finance a, a short film and, and do that. Um, like I've, I've used to work for Blur Studio quite a lot, uh, Tim Miller's company, and we did um, a lot of short films like In the Rough, Go for Broke, um, Gentleman's Duel, you know, all that stuff, Rockfish. So that was always interesting kind of um, getting everyone together to do these passion projects. But uh, I love the idea of like doing it specifically to kind of test out like how this is going to work before you go do it with someone else's money. Um, so, you know, I think that's kind of cool. And for you though, like, uh, was that, you know, did you always want to be a director or was it the fact that you kind of got, no, united? literally I'm saying, I'm saying like literally two, like I had even that first project, I did not even say that I was going to direct it at first. I just literally had this idea. Like I was like, technical direct it. <laughs> I was like, I didn't even know. I was just sort of like, I always, you know, I, I liked the idea. I mean, I worked at, I, 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 I had, a. Uh, I, you know, I had multiple offers. Like I could have gone a, a lot of places uh, coming out of grad school, um, you know, and I, I was like, I want to go to Disney because they know animation and I like animation. Um, and I got there and I'm like, well, I don't really understand how animation is made. So I it was really much more of just like, a, I'm curious. I'm here. I'm supposed to be like, right. You know, again, I'm trying to do my job well. Mm-hmm. I want to I want to write software for that, you know, that these artists and these amazing people can use to, to make these, these feature films. Um, but God damn it. I don't really understand like how, what goes through their heads. Like they, they think differently than I do. So let, let me understand what they're doing. It was, it was really started out being purely a desire to like do my day job better, Mm -hmm. but it was a light switch. I mean, like literally two weeks in, I went from that to like, Oh my God, this is so awesome. This is what I want to do. Um, and again, I had the patience to be like, well, I mean, all right, yeah, great. Lots of people want to write and direct. Right. But like, you know, I, I knew that, uh, I actually had to 
figure out how to do it. Um, so that, that was really my, um, that that was my light bulb moment. It was like two weeks into that first project. That's so cool. And I don't think I told, I don't think I told anyone, I mean, other than, you know, at first a girlfriend and then, you know, then a wife kind of really what my heart's desire was. Although I think by year four, I think, you know, <laughs> everyone from the president of feature animation on down, they got it. <laughs> um, so, um, but what I was going to say was the one thing that was different for me from all those projects you mentioned was, uh, these projects were always, we, we call them like officially unofficial. So we got zero funding from Disney, like zero. Basically what they said was, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't get into any, don't get in anyone's way. Don't stop any production from doing anything. You know, we're not going to give you any money, but you can sort of like use the facilities as long as it's after hours and, um, and you don't fuck anything up. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, that was super challenging, right? Because you're basically, uh, it's a, you're running this political game as well as trying to like get this creative stuff going because what is, what is the producer of a big, you know, $150 million film care about your project? If you're, you know, your render jobs show up in the queue at midnight mm -hmm. and you're like, what, what production is that? You know? Uh, so I was always sort of like, um, I was always sort of trying to just figure out how to work the system. And, uh, and it was challenging. Like I said, you know, we never were able to work out on it during the day. There was no like official sanctioning of this being a, um, you know, a Disney project. You're tiptoeing um, around everyone else, basically. Tiptoeing around. And so, you know, the, uh, I mean, that's just harder to do, right? Then like Chub Chubs, the production, uh, production value of that and all those in the rough, all those, like the production value is so high. Um, partly because of, you know, that the sort of like resources that were mm. put into yeah, it. Yeah, they were embraced so, by the studio. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so that was just never the case. And so that was definitely super challenging and to figure out how to still get something out. Like, and again, each one just sort of like improved or, uh, upon the, the one before it um, was hard, but also fun. And it definitely had a direct impact on sort of what I'm doing now because, um, you know, I'm still Pipsqueak Films is still no Disney. Like we I still have to kind of use that same mindset, even though we've got, you know, we have whatever at any given time, two, three, four, five projects going at a time. Man, it's not, you know, we're not doing 150 million dollar things. Like I have to figure out how to be scrappy, how to like um make a little bit go a long way so that we can make money, I can pay everyone. Um and I don't know that I would be as good at that if I hadn't gone through this kind of 10 year experience of basically um, producing these shorts with literally nothing like with uh, literally me paying for some pizza money. Um, you know, what I mean, like that and, and still being able to, you know, to put out this sort of uh, small series of shorts. So, again, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm generally a look on the bright side of things. It was really hard as 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 I was doing it, but at the same time, it's sort of like, it was the, um, uh, it was the crucible, uh, that sort of allowed me to, um, uh, you know, make a this sort of, you know, fairly successful run of, um, uh, of my sort of post Disney career. So that's awesome. And I'm curious, like what dates were they like when you, you did the first short film and I think it was 99 around there, right? Or yeah, I think the first one was finished around 99. That sounds right. Mm -hmm. Um, the next one was finished maybe three years later. And then, uh, and the last one was probably around 2000, I have to look, I, have to look. I think this is, it came out like around 2005 or right. something like that. Cool. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think back and I'm like, it's crazy, man. I, how did I do? I don't know how I did it. Like, it's like, they're short, right? They're not that long. They're, you know, they're, uh, whatever the you know, three to five minutes. It's not a lot of like footage over 10 year period. Mm -hmm. And I think of like sort of what we're able to do now. And I really, I'm like, you know, it's an order of magnitude, uh, difference in terms of, um, of throughput. Yeah. But, um, I don't know, man. Like, I just loved it. Right. I mean, you have to love it. Like to, in order to, <laughs> in order to go in, I mean, I, I'm not exaggerating. Like I would, I would literally go for almost a 10 year period. I mean, there might've been, you know, in between productions, I might have taken like a few months off where I'm like, I just like, I just need to decompress, but essentially for a 10 year period, uh, five, six, or sometimes seven days a week from six until between nine and 11 every night, um, I would be putting time into these projects. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I think back and I'm like, man, would I do it? 
now I'm like, I don't know if I would. Uh, <laughs> but at the time I was just like, I, I, it was like, I had to do it. I mean, you know, like, you know, artists feel that way. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, and again, I'm not, I, I want to, I want to preface this. Like I don't consider myself an artist. Um, but like, I, I know a lot of artists and I know the passion that artists have. We're like, you know, I have to draw, I have to paint. Um, I felt like I had to do this. Like I, I just, uh, you know, I had to do it. So, um, I don't know. Most of the people I know who have been able to stay in the industry for, um, a long enough chunk of time. And again, also to do a certain amount of humor, I think they have a certain amount of that. I have to do it. Um, you know, gut feeling. Yeah. I, I, def- I, I don't know. I don't know how you, I don't know how you, no, you I agree. Feel, I agree. Like, uh, I definitely think it's a young man's game. And that's the thing is like, I remember, um, probably about a year ago I was, I was at a studio like doing one of those late nights and I was kind of looking around the, the room and there's so many people who are like 20, 21 and they were like, pretty much thanking the studio for giving him the opportunity to be burning the midnight oil and getting to do that. And, um, you know, for me, it's just like at that point in my life, I'm just like, all right, like I've, I've done (laughs) my 10 billion hours, uh, you know, for someone else. And, um, you know, for me, it's more, you know, I've done that. I don't need to do this anymore. And, but at the same time, I think that, I think it's so critical that you do go through that period of like being in the, in the trenches and bleeding um, cause I know a lot of people who haven't, and I think that it's such a different uh, mindset for those who've kind of earned, um, you know, they've been through the war and they've kind of like earned their stripes, I guess, uh, opposed to the others who kind of had a, a much more easy route and later in their career, I feel like if they don't do it, then they're going to end up having to do it, uh, later. And it's not really when you want to, um, have to sacrifice a lot more time and, and effort. So, yeah, I think we all going to bleed at some point. I actually, I had like, um, a career intensive I was holding online uh, a few months ago and we kind of go into the subject about like studios and you know you know I, I think some people were kind of surprised like oh wait visual effects isn't unionized like really and so I had to explain like yeah and you know usually you're gonna have to work for crappy studios but I found later in my career the the more years I put in the better like the less I get you know I have to worry about whether I'm going to get paid or not. And on top of that, the the studio's quality improves. And you can pretty much draw like a, a very linear straight diagram where it's like the beginning of your career and then the, the end of your career. And hopefully uh, what it's going to be is the beginning, you're going to be working for sketchy studios who don't know what they're doing. Uh, there's so much drama and BS and like all the negative things you can think about, including getting paid crap money, all that stuff is there. And then when you're later in your career, magically you're working for these amazing places you're getting given opportunities you would never imagine you can paid really good money and everything is great and really it comes down to because you've earned your way to that point where you're not going to work for studios typically that um have financial issues or are disorganized or any of these things because usually you can smell them a mile away and they can't afford you anyway and like just in general everything naturally gets better as you progress but because of that, you need to put in that time in the beginning. You need to to bleed and go in the trenches. Otherwise, um, later in life, you're not really going to a um, be able to see those those places that you got to avoid. But on top of that, you know, I think you have a better understanding and appreciation for um, the time that you put in earlier on. I think so. Yeah. Well, that's fu- that's funny because, like, I mean, <laughs> I'm uh, I'm mid career, I guess. But I'm you know, I started the other way, right? Like, I mean, I started at the the, 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 you know, the best place in the world to, to do animation. Mm -hmm. Um, and I basically, I basically like left that to go and start, uh, something on my own, you know, completely from scratch. Um, and you know, we've, you know, we're, we're, we're growing year over year, but uh, you know, we are never going to be Disney. And I I guess from my perspective, (laughs) from my perspective, I don't care. Yeah. Like, like what I, what I've realized is over the years more and more is I like making stuff. Um, and the more I get to sort of put myself into that, that thing that we're producing, the happier I am. So, um, you know, I, I want to be directing uh, a big animated feature at some point, but I also realized, boy, it's awfully fun to like, uh, uh, you know, come up with a concept and sell it and have someone go, yeah, your studio can go make that and then go and go back to the trenches and like you get to make it, you know, mm-hmm. uh, like that to me is super fun. Um, and, um, yeah, you know, I, I, I I'm fine with life. You know what I mean? Like, and there's a certain amount of me where I'm like, yeah, things are cool. Like if we could continue going on like this and I would, I would, you know, I would have a very happy career, even though 
uh, it's not the same kind of financial security as working for um, for a big company. Mm -hmm. But like I said, because I went through it early, um, yeah, you know, I, I don't I just don't have the same kind of financial worries that um, someone who started from the other end of the spectrum maybe has to has to worry about. Yeah. Um, so, you know, again, I like I I get it. I think most people are, uh, who are successful in this um, uh, in this field follow that path that that you just sort of sketched out. Um, and again, I, I don't know where like I don't know where I'm going to be in five years. You know, if the uh, project that I have in development at um, can, I, can I segue and say, well, I know where you're going to oh, be yeah, for sure. the next four years. <laughs> uh, See what you, I did there? You, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So in addition to all this, so, you know, it's interesting because like, um, you know, I've been so focused on, you know, career and building Pipsqueak films and, you know, selling, selling, selling and bringing in new clients. Um, and, I, you know, I mean, I like that's what I was doing. And then, you know, this election happened and um, I sort of took a uh, I, I don't know, I got shocked, I guess, like a lot of people did. And I um, I sort of realized all that stuff is super important and I need to keep doing it. I need to, you know, I need to make money. Uh, but I also realized, um, uh, man, the world is a really weird place and I don't understand it as well as I thought I did. And I, I wanted to do something to, um, that was both positive, but also push back on what I believe are, you know, incredibly regressive policies of this current administration. Um, and I had seen a post, um, uh, my animation supervisor had put on Facebook, um, it was like right after the election, he's just like, you know what, I'm just going to go do like, I'm going to just go do like animation um, uh, and, you know, going to uh, fight this current administration that way. And I was like, oh, man, that's a great idea. Um, but I realized like very quickly that it needed uh, it needed like an organization behind that kind of idea in order to be able to produce animation that would have a message that would both resonate uh, in a way that might actually have a positive experience and also be able to sort of like actually get out in the world. Um, so basically like, you know, a week after the election, I started this uh, um, organization called Our Next Four Years and we are doing animated PSAs. It's all volunteer group. So I am doing this along with literally, uh, I have to look at the database now, I think like about 250 uh, other artists at this point and, and growing. Um, we are producing a series of animated PSAs, which are, um, you know, essentially pushing back on uh, regressive policies across a broad array of topics. So we just literally uh, uh, yesterday released our first spot on the ACA, um, and we've got a whole bunch of other ones that are in the pipeline, and, um, and you know, we're pushing them out in the world. And I kind of feel like that's the best way that I can um, – you know, sort of put my volunteer hours in. I'm not much of a handholder or a, mm -hmm. um, uh, a guy who likes to go to protests and march. Um, um, and I, I figured, why not use my professional skills to sort of um, help inform the debate? So the spots are all positive. They're all fact based mm -hmm. um, and they're entertaining. Um, they're either they're, we hope they're, they'll either make people laugh or cry. But, you know, uh, um, you know, push you to feel something while at the same time is informing. So, That's so cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, like everyone, please check out our next four years dot org. That's for the number four. Um, cool. And I'll definitely and, link to uh, it in the show notes as well. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Cool. I like that. You're fighting the president with a pencil, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, man. Like you know, media is powerful, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, people uh, they, they 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 try to argue it for both sides of their mouths, but obviously, like you know. There, people put billions of dollars into advertising because they recognize that it helps influence people. So, um, you know, the idea is to take our creative talents. Um, you know, again, we've like we literally have numerous Academy Award winners and nominees, and Emmy Award winners and nominees. Like, it's a really packed group of of, of folks. Take leverage all of that talent to produce stuff that's really entertaining um, and is like from a storytelling perspective kind of works, but then we partner with these other groups cause like we're not, you know, we're not all like politically connected or necessarily um, have all of the, you know, the facts on any one particular issue at the tip of our fingertips. Um, so we partner with all these groups that, 
sort of make up for what we don't have. Um, and uh, we feel like that's like kind of the best way of, uh, of, of getting messages out, which are both pointed, accurate and entertaining. Um, and, you know, uh, so far, so good. Uh, response has been uniformly positive. And, um, yeah, you know, we're just like all just want to do good and try to have a positive impact and not dwell on, you know, all the, the, the negative tumult, which um, is pretty hard to ignore or avoid at this point. It's like, you know, my feeds are, are, are full of it. So <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah. yeah, that's awesome, actually. And I'll, I'll definitely link to that in the show notes as well. Um, what about your talk in Paris? Because we're both going to be around this time next month uh speaking in paris it's going to be nice and cold and rainy uh as it is every year at this time but um yeah do you want to talk a little bit about what you'll be presenting there uh yeah i mean you know i'm i'm still working on the talk but it's basically going to be a little bit of um the kinds of things we're even just talk, talking about right now i think that for me the best way of of talking to folks is to um is to give a little bit of my story. And by being very specific on what my story has been, I think that people can sort of generalize uh, no matter, you know, what kind of artist you are or what you want to be. I think that you can pull lessons from um, my particular experience. And I'm going to try to draw those connections uh, uh, to help people along. But uh, I'm going to sort of uh, I'm going to try to sort of impart that. And I don't know, what do we have out like we I think we have 30 or 45 minutes there. So, you know, it it goes very quickly. Um, And I've done a number of talks like this over the years. So I'm going to over the years, I'm going to sort of update that talk and um, yeah, kind of give people an overview of uh, of 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 my history and then, um, you know, give people some advice on uh, how they can take some of the less the hard the hard won lessons that I've learned mm-hmm. uh, and apply it to uh, to their own careers um, I don't want to go down the path like I, I said I, I'm not I'm not an artist like I'm, no one's ever gonna hire me to uh, be a character designer or to be an animator or to be any one of the other you know uh, specialties that require you know fine arts skills and um, I've seen the portfolios of you and everyone else like I, that's not that's not what that's not what they're bringing me over there for. Um, what I can do is um, give people a real sense of what things are like in a big studio, what things are like in a small studio, how to be able to kind of you know compare and contrast, take the best of of both of them uh, to kind of figure out how to you know drive their own careers, whether they're at the beginning or or middle. That's so awesome. Um, yeah, cool. I'll definitely be attending that talk. That sounds great. <laughs> Yeah. Um, cool. Cool, man. Um, what else? What else can I? Uh, no, I got, that's else? it. I mean, I want to be really respectful of your time. Uh, trust me, there is so many more questions I'd I'd love to ask, but um, maybe I can get you back another time to dive into a few other subjects that um, I'd love to pick your brain about. But uh, for the time being, though, I mean, uh, if anyone wants to reach out to you or find out more about you, are there any links you'd recommend that they check out? Well, uh, definitely um, go to our website, which is uh, pipsqueakfilms.com. Um, I'm sure Alan, you mm-hmm. can put a link to that. Absolutely. Um, our next four years, uh, that's org. our next four years.org, um, uh, for this sort of volunteer project. Um, I mean, those are probably the, the two best places to connect. Obviously, you know, we've got Facebook presence and Twitter and, you know, at Pipsqueak films and, you know, you, you'll find us on Facebook. You're everywhere. Uh, but if you, <laughs> yeah, you know, you got, you gotta be a little bit of everywhere, but, um, uh, yeah, you know, we're, we're easy to find and we're easy to get in, uh, in contact with. So, That's so awesome. I thank you again for doing this. It's been really great. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on Alan. Appreciate it. And I look forward to uh, meeting you in person in what, uh, yeah, about a month. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of beer to be had. Yeah, baby. Okay. So I really hope you enjoyed that. I found this to be so insightful and Mike was kind enough to share so much insight into his career and a lot of his journey along the way. I'm looking forward to meeting up with Mike as well as all the other speakers like Neil Blevins, Ash Thorpe, Dan Rorty, and all the other amazing speakers at the It's Art Masterclass. If you want to find out more about this event, it will be in the show notes. Or you can go over to IAMag, short for magazine.co. So in other words, www.iamag.co. 
and you'll be able to sign up for the event there as well. So I hope to see you at the event. Uh, like I said, it's going to be in March. And if you want to attend, you get to hang out with me and many other people. And like I said, I'm not mentioning this for any profitable gain or anything like that at all. Uh, I will be speaking at the event and I truly believe in it. I love it. And I've just found it to be such a, a great time getting to hang out with all the attendees as well as all the other speakers. And that's why I wanted to kind of give it a quick plug. So that's it for now. And I'll be back next episode. I'll be talking with Pixelogic, the developers of ZBrush. Um, we go into so much stuff. It's going to be a cool episode. I can't wait. All right. So I will talk to you soon. Rock on. Rock on.